I start off every lecture just by wanting to pay special attention to our sponsors. Our sponsors are Bartlett Tree Experts, College of the Environment and Life Sciences, and the Rhode Island chapter of the ASLA. And we thank them for their contributions and support. Our next speaker will be two weeks from this evening. Marion Presley will be coming from Presley Associates in Boston. Same time, same place. This evening, we're, we're very pleased to have Gary Hildebrand with us. Um, founding principal of Reed Hildebrand from 1996, I think, is when they, they started their partnership. Gary's a landscape architect registered in 13 states, and I know that registration, many of you say, so how many states do I get registered in? There's 13. Gary received his BLA from the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry, cum laude, which is Syracuse. And he went to the Harvard Graduate School of Design for his Master's of Landscape Architecture. As an individual, uh, as an individual he's received numerous awards. He was, he was selected as a Rome Prize Fellow by the American Academy in Rome, elected as a fellow of the ASLA, selected as one of the emerging voices by the Architectural League of New York, the Thaler Memorial Lecturer at the University of Virginia in 2013, and the firm has received numerous awards as well. I won't get into those. The only one I will mention is that this year, Reed Hildebrand was selected as ASLA's Firm of the Year for 2013, which is a rather prestigious award. Congratulations. Uh, Gary's a teacher. He has taught at Harvard since 1990. He's currently the professor of practice of landscape architecture and has also served as the director of the MLA program. He's been a guest reviewer at many institutions, including Columbia, MIT, and the Universities of Virginia, Illinois, and Toronto, etc. He's lectured widely, having given talks in Athens, Greece, and Barcelona. Um, he's also spoken at many museums, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and the Dallas <coughs> Art Museum in Dallas. He's lectured at the University of Virginia, SUNY College uh, in Syracuse, Colorado State University, and has given numerous public presentations at ASLA annual meetings. He's got numerous publications as well. I will not list them all, but he's authored monographs, including Visible, Invisible, Landscape Works of Reed Hildebrand with Doug Reed and Eric Kramer by Met Metropolis Books, The Miller Garden, Icon of Modernism by Space Maker Press. He's authored other publications, The Long View, Boston's Christian Science Plaza, Can Evolve Without Sacrificing Its Greatest Moment in Landscape Architecture Magazine in 2013, and also in 2013, hopefully you've all seen it, was his interview with Mick Young, Young Kim uh, in August 2013. He's had pieces in Topos, Ecological Urbanism, the Harvard, Harvard Design Magazine, and this is, this is a CV uh, of a professional designer and an educator who's accomplished much in our profession of landscape architecture. Please welcome um, Doug, Doug, please, Gary Hildebrand, excuse me. <laughs> Thank you, Will. Thanks, everybody. How you doing? Great. They're all sitting in the back. Some, there are more, slightly more expensive seats in the front. Well, thanks. It's good to be back. I was here lecturing, um, I don't know, I think seven or eight years ago. And um, it's a nice occasion to be back. <coughs> Anybody have a telescope? Why would I call my talk telescopic? Um, 
This is one of the ways I've come to think of our field. So if you want to think about it, maybe the simplest way to think about telescope or telescopic is in how we view something. So we can view something as a panoramic, or we can scope it in and view it as a close-up. If you think about one of the tools of landscape architecture, we think in section, right? So if you think about a section through the earth, we can see the world from above, right? You use, everybody's got a map on their phone tonight. I used one to get here tonight. Um, but we also can look inside the crust of the earth, right? We can understand depth. So that's also telescopic in my view. If you think about time, we think about the past, and we also try to project in the future. I think of that as telescopic also. Scale, we work at many scales, and one of the things I'm going to try to show you tonight is, you know, through four or five projects, sense of graduating scale, of telescoping scales. And we can think about it even from our relationship to the world, thinking about your individual point of view, or your relationship to society. And um, we had a nice little dinner before the talk, and um, you know, I was reminded of something else, which is that in discussion, our, our, our field also, the field of landscape architecture is a part of a much larger field called landscape. And it ranges from making a garden in your backyard to organizing resources for the state of Rhode Island, right? And it may be gardening, it might be building, it might be designing, it might be all three of those. It might be conserving or preserving something. It might be regulating. It might be worrying about people trespassing on resources. And it might be advocating. It might be, you know, that landscape architecture is a cause for people. And so this, too, is a way of thinking telescopically about the field. So through a little panorama of our, of our work and through some detail of our work, I'll telescope through some things tonight that I hope are representative of the field. I wanted, I like to show um, what my daily community looks like. This is, this is our office, kind of. Uh, actually, I'm missing. I'm not there, but I'm here, so that's okay. Um, the office is a kind of, you know, it's a little family or a community, and um, it's a wonderful thing to have an office like that. I'm from the Hudson Valley in upstate New York, and I grew up in the 60s when that river was a dreadful, poisoned mess. But I learned as a kid, I kind of lived just around the bend there. But I learned as a kid that um, this was the place where scenic culture was born in America in a, in a certain way. People thought about what it meant to move across <coughs> the continent and how it could be represented. And that was perplexing to me place was getting ruined, but it was really like the paradise. And so that was something that I felt I wanted to help work out. So, you know, I was, as a kid, I was an environmentalist. I, I'll, I'll bet there's a bunch of environmentalists in the room tonight. And then I was drawn to the field because of other reasons as well. And so I'm from right there. But I also think of myself as being from right there. And, you know, that's a 19th century view, late 19th century view of the, of the town I lived in until I was around six. And that's a view of a little community that I lived in until I was in college. And this relationship of, and these are one mile apart. And in the summers, we walked from there to there almost every day. And so that small town life, which I think of as urban, 
and rural at the same time was really formative for me. It was also um, close to New York City. And I lo what I loved to do was to get on the train and go and walk there. You know, when I was in high school, it was kind of a drug haven, kind of a music place, but it was really something. You know, much later in life, I've had the opportunity to understand Central Park from that view also. Not because I own a home there, I, I don't, but because I've worked on a few rooftops there, which is really great. And that's, you know, for me, telescopic in time. You know, I've always had this relationship to Central Park. And telescopic in view and perspective. I can get, you know, the immersion view, which I, I loved as a kid, and I can get the panoramic view there. And that's been meaningful for me. I also feel like I was very lucky to be introduced to these two books. One about the need to rescue the earth, designed with nature. I hope you've read it. And the other, I hope you've also read, by Lauren Salperin, about why cities are so compelling, why they're so great, why we live in cities, why we make cities, why we build cities, and why they can be thought of as landscapes. Now I'm going to do a little detour here. And I know that Angelo teaches you about Olmsted. Um, and I'm not here to teach you about Olmsted either, but I, I'm going to take four minutes and uh, telescope through what I think has been important for me in understanding the career of Frederick Law Olmsted and how I think it defines the opportunity of our field. And these two slides could say a lot about that. You, you're, you're, you're familiar with the design of cent the Central Park. I lost my pointer. There it is. And that's not a small landscape. You know, that's 820 acres. That's a really big landscape, right? Olmsted was responsible for helping to get that made and helping to get that saved. One is on the East Coast, one is on the West Coast. It took him two weeks to get from the East Coast to the West Coast because he had to go by ship to Panama, cross the Isthmus. That took a couple of days, and then sail on to San Francisco, and then a two-day journey to Yosemite. It's a big deal, right? But my interest here is in, imagine one, one person and his operation in charge of thinking about that range of scales. Olmsted was a writer also. He was one of the founders of the nation. You could buy it you know, tonight if you go to Providence in a bookstore. Um, important magazine then and still. But you know, he was a writer and an editor. He commissioned writers to write about social issues. He was the head of the U.S. Sanitation Commission which was the predecessor to what we know as the Red Cross. And his task there was to clean up the battlefields of the Civil War, moving thousands of dead and healing, trying to heal, trying to keep alive many more thousands of injured. Olmsted was good at provisioning, so he, you know, he would get ships, he would, he would rent the ships, he would provision them in New York, he would sail them to Virginia, they would cart off to Gettysburg, and they would take care of the dead and the dying. And so this was really what we come to know as public health. He knew how to organize. He's one of the people responsible for keeping Niagara Falls from the developers that wanted to build immediately on top of it. He designed towns and settlements. Riverside, Illinois, for instance, really a predecessor to how much of the 19th and 20th century developed in America. He designed the Capitol grounds, the U.S. Capitol grounds. He decided, he recommended to the generals in charge of that development that this edge, this side of the Capitol would be better with big terraces so that we could have a westerly view that would represent the way our democracy stands at the edge of the continent looking west. He 
He designed for the wealthy. You know, the biggest house on earth, kind of. Biggest house in North America at the time, for sure. Cornelius Vanderbilt's um, mansion in Asheville, North Carolina. All those things. He, he, he helped invent forestry. You know, we could go on and on. I mean, he, the work in Boston survives. Some of it's not in great shape. Turned from a, you know, an estuary in a swamp through that plan into a really important park system and even conceived of that as a regional park system. He built in Brookline, Massachusetts, the prototype for American landscape architecture practices. Pretty productive person. <laughs> and so, you know, if I could telescope through that amazing 60, 70 year career, the subjects were about national heritage, about advocacy, social issues. He was an abolitionist. He helped to fight slavery. Is that me? Conceived of a public health condition for the United States. He was a kind of epidemiologist of his time. He was a regionalist. He was a reformer. All of these things. And in a sense, landscape architecture inherits the example of Olmsted and could see it as a burden because it's kind of unachievable for anyone to do all of those things in our time. But it's also the great opportunity of the field. And so, okay, the four minute lesson there is really about how I like to think as a designer and as a teacher that I live in a world in a, in a set of traditions that is very tall, it's very crucial, it's an art, it's many things, and I want to convey that to you as students. The opportunity of the field is really, really gigantic and it's telescopic. So here's a little bit of a panorama of, of projects. Doug Reed and I kind of built our firm by winning a competition for a project for a botanical collection at the Arnold Arboretum of Harvard University in Boston. This is just one, one photograph of that and you know it's always been the kind of touchstone for me because you know it's kind of the bedrock of our field. We've um, built urban plazas and parks. These are two, one in Boston, the other in Somerville. We do gardens, residential work. This is a project in Phoenix, Arizona for the Phoenix Art Museum, Mount Auburn Cemetery and other cemetery work, urban plazas and riverfronts, waterfronts, campuses. This is work, recent work at MIT, streets. If, if anybody told me when I was you know, 15 years old that I would get a charge out of designing a street, I would have thought they were crazy. But designing a street is a pretty crucial act. Getting everything in the right place is pretty important. And if it's going to have any tree life, getting those trees to have a long, long life is not a simple thing, as I will describe. We do a lot of work on campuses. This is just a kind of panorama of a very big campus of Duke University. It's, it's um, probably not, not dissimilar to the size of your own campus. And a massive amount of work that we've been doing there over the past six or seven years, just illustrations like this. But I want to move to getting some detail in projects. And a couple of them may be familiar to you, but um, this one, The Central Wharf in Boston, has been published a lot. We'll mention some of that. And for me, the project is about a couple of things. One is the presence of trees in the city. Never take it for granted. They will grow if you leave them be, but depending on the species, they'll keel over in 8 or 10 years or maybe 15 years, maybe 20 or 30 years. Artists like Alfred Stieglitz and Edward Steichen in the first decade of the 20th century projected a view of the city through nature. And that's compelling to me. And as I mentioned, you know, 
my experience of New York City was partly about 6th Avenue with high-rise buildings, 5th Avenue and Times Square with all of its busyness, and then this incredible space where there are 300 American elm trees that were planted in 1870 and 1875. They've been there a really long time. And so what is, what is, what is that about and how do, you, how do you think about it if you're asked to design a street? A few years ago we did some research and really started to say that if you wanted, I know it's hard to read on the screen, but if you wanted the, what we call the ecosystem benefits of street trees to really happen, you couldn't do it if you didn't provide the environment below the street or below the <laughs> plaza that would allow the nutrient exchange and the growth to occur, to occur, biological processes to occur, moisture to be exchanged and air. You can do it and it's, you know, in a few years time it may, be, it may have been a waste. And so we began this cycle of understanding what it takes for trees to survive what their benefits are, and what the tragedy is if they don't survive. In this case, these are photographs from New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Rita. I think these are immediately after Hurricane Katrina. You know, a vast amount of live oak trees, probably many of them 60, 80, 100 years old, just snapped, you know, really destroyed. Not to minimize the damage to homes and streets and streetcars and businesses and lives, but I, I became kind of angry about this. And you know, the, the canopy, the shade in New Orleans is really important. So we really, really began to think about a campaign of shade and how you do it. And around this time, and actually these are coincidental, we were invited to try to fix that. that. This is the waterfront in Boston. There's the Customs House Tower, if you know that, downtown. And this is not so appealing, but it sat there for about 20 years. And we were invited, um, competed for this commission. And it was my instinct to say, well, really could use some shade. And in fact, shade could be something of an identity for the space, given that there isn't that much of it around. There's a little bit over there. These images were also kind of interesting for me. These are photographs from around 1900 in Paris. There's a crop of trees, those are London plane trees, growing in some soil, not, probably not a lot of soil, with some provision for soil biology and chemistry to occur below the street. And kind of a handmade surface. And putting these together, we thought, well, let's see, you know, this is lovely, you know, guys are placing the stone and then guys are taking a heavy piece of wood and tamping them. Interesting to try to make that. So we did, we did try to make that. Nice to note that, you know, one of your sponsors, Bartlett, tree. In fact, Greg Carbone, one of your graduates, helped us with this project and quite a few other projects. We wanted to make something that seemed as if it was there all the time, always, had always been there almost, and maybe the trees would be there for a really long time. So we just conceived of it honestly as a grove of trees, a shaded plaza. It's tiny. It's about twice the size of this room and there were 25 trees on it. And the idea was to build a plaza, but underneath that plaza to have a kind of ecosystem that would support the life of those trees for a really long time. Pretty complicated thing. And the site was tiny. We actually got the site to be double, and more than doubled the number of trees through about a year of negotiation. This is a diagram that has been published around a bit, but it explains in some detail how you make something like this, how you build it so that these trees might 
last. So that's kind of a picture of the ground plane. The dots are where the trees were. These are, these are benches. We, we wanted to elevate this, have a slightly inclined plane so that we could capture the runoff. And that when you got to the water's edge, which is just here, you were actually two feet higher. You could see over the, all the gang planks and all of that into the harbor. The client wanted also a garden in that space. I would have done that differently, but they, they wanted to have both a plaza and a garden. And so beneath this, there's a spaghetti of stuff, including pile supports. This used to be water. This was in the water. And so the walls and the stairs are supported on grade beams, not footings. And the footings are skinny piles that go in, a lot of them, as you can see. And then around that, we build a soil medium, 1,200, almost 1,300 cubic feet of soil per tree. So again, there's the surface. We really wanted to pave right up to the trees, as you saw in the photograph from Paris. And that meant that this paving has to be supple. It has to have air and moisture moving through it. So it has to be almost diaphanous in a way. We selected three different granites, had the tops sawn so they were quite flat, tumbled in a big bin so they look rugged. So these joints are varied. That's on purpose. Looks handmade, right? And that drain is a part of this system, which allows every bit of water that falls on these trees and in this plaza to go into a, a drain system and then return to the root balls. So all of the water feeds all of the trees. There's, of course, more earth here, so that doesn't need the drainage system. It's pervious. There's a supplementary irrigation system in case the, of drought. <coughs> the trees were all guyed with very big kind of mechanical nooses so that they wouldn't move. They're quite large trees, 12-inch trees we brought here. And there's also upwelling of moisture from below grade here. And so there's a drainage system that allows us to haul off that water if we need to. So the result is, it was instant. This is the year we were completed. Pretty big trees growing almost together. And the idea was that these trees will in fact grow like this as a body. 25 of those trees. And you can see the surface is, you know, slightly rough. Um, Greg will tell you now that, you know, it's, you know, the pavers are moving around like this, something that feels really right to me, feels good, feels organic, handmade, reactive. And then we just floated wires across it and lit it from tiny little can lights in the canopy. It was a great satisfaction in making something like that. It felt like it came out of a tradition, but it also felt contemporary in the technologies we were applying. Okay, for a different kind of project altogether now. <coughs> this is a house in Texas. You might not think it's a house. It seemed to me when I first went here, well, it doesn't look much like a house. Philip Johnson, the architect of, of great notoriety of the mid-century modernist period, designed this house and its surrounds. This is what it looked like when I got there first time, I think 2004, maybe 2003. Kind of didn't know what to make of it. Surely didn't seem domestic, right? 
but the owners, the, the young couple that bought it, the second owners, so that they bought it from the original owner, were really interested in reviving this house. And we spent quite a lot of time considering how Philip Johnson in that mid-century period had conceived of houses and about the transparency and the way of furnishing something, and most importantly, the relationship to the landscape which is codified in the glass house here, shown in New Canaan, Connecticut. And, you know, we made our own kind of studies of this condition. Fortunately, it's an interesting site that spans two blocks, well, one deep block, with a <coughs> creek running through the middle. And the creek, well, this is barely a creek. Um, this is from our first visit pretty much a jungle, though, you know, I have come to think since that an ecologist would describe this very differently than I did for a long time. I, I just saw it as an impenetrable mass and a tangle and a wreck, a degraded landscape in my view. I was reminded by my colleague Richard Foreman at Harvard that there's another way to see this. You know, there's, a, there's an urban wildlife and there is a habitat there, that's for sure. Well, we cleaned its clock, as you'll see, but um, now, some days, that creek looks like this. As the result of very poor drainage practices in, you know, the suburban reaches of Dallas. This is in the city, but it's, it's kind of suburban. If it rains really hard, in one hour, it looks like that. And then about three hours later, it looks pretty mellow again. But I can tell you that it's pretty scary to stand on the bridge when that's happening. Philip Johnson made a little kind of mock-up of this in his own backyard in New Canaan, interestingly. And here's a site plan of Johnson's project. And, you know, we found it to be kind of not well related to its surrounding landscape, not at all in the way that Johnson's own house was, for instance. So really, in a sense, a kind of underdeveloped scheme. And we thought, well, okay, you know, we, we've been asked to do this. We can, we can sort of fix it. We can try to open up the project and make it seem as if it were more connected to its ground, its landscape. So we changed a whole lot, including, you know, these conditions which were essentially walling off the house from its landscape. Beautiful, some, some of this is a fantastic thing. I mean, this is an amazingly beautifully constructed stair. It's one of a pair, very kind of grand idea about the interior of a house. But, but these conditions, immediately outside of that, completely frustrating in my view. And so, you know, we kept asking the question, well, how to, how to get this house back on the ground? The, the, the geometry <coughs> of Philip Johnson's project was related entirely to this pecan orchard. This whole neighborhood was a pecan orchard until it was subdivided. And you can see that, you know, the center axis of the house was organized just directly on those pecan trees. It's kind of simple. There's not much sophistication in that idea. We were more interested in this geometry, let's say, or that system, that order, which is rotated from the order of the house. And we were interested, there, there was a swimming pool here and there was a tennis court here, but we were interested in trying to make this property seem like one. And they didn't. The order of the house and the orchard was one thing, this was another. Here's a kind of axonomic view, of, axonometric view rather, of, uh, of the finished project. And you can see that we, of course, accepted that geometry, but also broke it. And then we took that order, happens to be a diagonal, didn't exist otherwise, and we kind of pushed it into the house and pushed it all the way out to here. And then we kind of broke down Philip Johnson's idea of, you know, a pristine lawn here and put a big live oak there, trying to knit the close-up garden of the house of the house with its surrounding forest. And so there's there's a completed view where we that's that's the original wall. It used to be four feet high, now it's almost three. It's broken by a big stair, so then you can come through between those kind of stairs. It's a little bit like a corkscrew. 
you come out and move right down. More importantly, that opening really gives on to the landscape visually, and we thought, you know, carried out the procession idea that Johnson started but never finished. And then you can see these curbs, which are really a topographic system that helped us to make level ground and sloping ground work together to save some existing trees like this American elm. This is a red oak that we planted there. So not a gentle inter, in, you know, intervention. This, is a, this was a fairly serious intervention, but one that really f allowed you know, that lawn up there to feel really connected with that lawn down there. Quite a different thing and, and a real transformation. There's a good color photograph of that, um, a view where you can also see the restored stream. We uh, did a major stream restoration there, restored the bridge, and really tried as hard as we could to feel like these two parts of the property were joined. There's 4,000 running feet of those curbs. That's almost a mile. So they work as single six-inch risers. Or when we're talking about keeping existing trees there, they work as a foot and a half grade change if you just kind of stack them together. They actually form the terrace where there's a swimming pool there. And then from the house, they feel like a kind of, almost like an accordion, topographic accordion, or corrugation. And they knit both sides of the creek together. We had to make you know, level platforms for sculpture, a level platform for the swimming pool, and for the cabana, the tennis court, and so on. And so that's what it looks like on a really hot morning at about 5.30 in July. These are, all, these are all existing trees, and these curbs allowed us to keep all of those trees, keep the soil at exactly the right location. Now remember, that was a jungle. So we cleared out, I'm going to say, almost 100 small trees and a few large ones that were really failed, and innumerable privet shrubs mainly invasive plants that were, you know, we couldn't even get a survey here without the surveyors cutting a swath through that thicket. And I think, I like to think that what, what we did here was to find a space underneath that canopy. We restored the canopy, you know, brought the trees back to good health. We did a lot of pruning up in those crowns. These are cedar elms. They're all volunteers. Nobody planted any of those trees. And it was really really just very gratifying to try to find a space inside that thicket. There's just a view of the swimming pool and a new cedar elm that we planted, which will grow up and eventually join that canopy. There's a nice little moment in the project where Philip Johnson had a concrete slab where the owners stored their pots and plants. And we, we took that away, and it's right next to the private family entrance to the house, which is different from the kind of the formal public entrance, and, and just built a kind of s pool of water that has 12 little jets in it. Um, kind of a, you know, a, a, a quiet, reflective moment, though when it's sunny in the afternoon, the west sun sort of lights this wall on fire, which is really good. There's the little family entrance. Back out front, we restored the pecans to health. All of these trees have come back to really good health, and they're, they're extremely productive again. Installed this hedge as a, as a kind of um, screen at the street, and, um, and you know, really found a space in this canopy of live oak and cedar elm. Tiny project here, a little, little bigger than the size of this room, but not much, in Chicago. So um, the Poetry Foundation asked us to, 
produce a little courtyard as an entrance to their new building. And they think of, um, they like to think of poetry as an open door. And the building was conceived as a kind of transparent envelope. And what, what the Poetry Foundation does is they publish, and they have scholars, and they have readings. And the reading room wanted to be visible on the street. So with the architect, we were interested in thinking about layers and seeing through layers. And so two references that were significant for us. One, something called palimpsest, where in recorded manuscripts, medieval or Renaissance manuscripts, where the paper is thin enough that you can in fact see the text coming through from the other side. And what you get is a combination of things. You see both this side and that side. And we like that. And in this Paul Clay painting, um, it was interesting also that you could see shapes upon shapes. Right? You could see kind of a layering of shapes. It's a two-dimensional surface. So those things were interesting. And then we were also kind of interested in patterns. In this case, it's a pattern of a fabric, right? That's a that's a quilt made from denim <coughs> and sewn. It's quite a large quilt. Um, but that kind of pattern making was also interesting to us. So here's the building, the completed project. So you have the open door. Poetry is an open door. That's the corner of North Dearborn and Superior. It's open, and then it's also transparent. And there's the reading room. So you can see already this kind of layering happening. Right? If you go up closer, you can see there's a garden inside. And so you can really read explicitly those layers. Here's, here's a set of drawings that try to portray that. And the pattern that you can see from the G's Bend quilt is kind of coming alive there. And in three dimensions, that kind of seeing the other si seeing what's on the other side of a membrane is also happening. We learned from the Central Wharf project that if we're going to grow trees in a garden like this and we're going to pave it, we're going to have a system below it that's going to have an active biology. And so these little moss pockets are helping to feed, as are these little areas, a very significant soil area right there in which we are you know, continuing to see nutrient exchange. And these trees have really taken off now. It's the third year of this project. This was the first year when it was installed. And that, that, ki that, that characteristic of transparency comes you know, th kind of throughout the project. There's another way to see that. Another kind of project, really, really very different, out in the country. The owners of this property were interested in extending their fields and meadows and their cross-country trails through the woods. It's a big property, western Massachusetts. And we, we started to think about whether or not you could somehow occupy that wetland. You know, they'd, they'd, they've owned this property for 40 years, and of course they, they had no idea what it was like to be out there. You could go out on the ice. They didn't really do that. So we worked for a while to think about how we could occupy the marsh. And this is an image. Um, you know, these are neurons thinking about a network. How could you make a kind of connective network? So we figured out how to do that. It took about nine months to get permits to do this project because all of it was working in the water. And all of the work in the water is regulated, right? In this country, it is. And so here's how we did it. It's very simple construction. And by the way, we, we had you know, to lay this out, you know, we drew where we thought it would work from an aerial photograph. 
And then we had the surveyors go out in the water with waders and flag it and give us GPS data where the flags were. And then we adjusted that. They went back out and adjusted the flags. And then the Conservation Commission came out in waders and walked it. And then they said, OK, this is looking OK. We've got some concerns. Let us come back in the spring and see it when the water's really high. Conservation commissioners came back a second time, did the wading thing, and then they, with you know, one strong vote against, they, they gave us permission to do the project. So you know, why, why that? Well, they are worried about making a precedent. If you let somebody make a half mile long boardwalk in a, in a wetland, you have to worry about the next guy that comes and asks the permission to do that. So what we devised was, if you see these rods, these rods have a kind of screw on the end of them, and they go down into the mud six or eight feet. And then the rods are, are clamped by these two little beams. And then there's a kind of girder across those. And then there are decking boards. And then the last step is the saw along the edge. All this time, the c contractors are in the water. And they so loved building this project that they hated to see it end, because they really were enjoying themselves. Anyway, it, 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 it turned out that one of the concerns of the Conservation Commission was that this habitat, which is, of course, protected, has um, there, there would be impacts if there was shade on the water from the boardwalk. I kind of said, what? <laughs> but it's true. And so they said, one more requirement. We're going to make you raise the boardwalk where the streams are perennial so that there's more daylight coming in to the area below the water. And you know, I thought, well, that's going to ruin this. And it turns out to be a really great feature. So it not only does it do that, but it also does that gently. It's a great experience to walk through there. And then there are two places where you go out onto the middle of that water sheet. And it's really quite extraordinary because, again, you know, it's not, you could get out there in a canoe, but to stand out there was really, really quite extraordinary. So this past year, we just got permission and enlarged these so that, because the owners love this so much, they just wanted to be out there. We got permission to make those decks a little bit larger. Wonderful experience. The clients described it as a discovery, which I thought, you know, felt good to us. This is a competition that we um, participated in year before last. Ostensibly to design this, to, to, to redesign this space, which was designated by President George Washington as reservation number one of the United States, our first park. And then designed by Andrew Jackson Downing in the middle of the 19th century and really revised by Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. in the 1930s. The real issue for the, the reason for the competition was the security <coughs> along here. Post, in the post 9-11 environment, this has become a kind of unfortunate space. This is one of the perspectives from our competition submittal. <coughs> Come back to that. So <coughs> in our view, it was the case that if there's an important world event that gets everybody's attention, it's sometimes likely that the opening scene in the nightly news is that view right there, right? If the President of the United States is going to make a pronouncement, this is kind of the view you get on the screen while you're waiting for the President to you know, clear his throat and tighten his tie. And in recent years, and of course, you know, it's a place of great ceremony, but in recent years, it looks like that. You know, there's just like, Jersey barriers and lots of armed guys and uh, armored vehicles and so on. And 
you know, not to diminish this, I mean, it's crucially important, but so that's what it looks like. And in some days, you just can't even get any closer than this to that view. In fact, you know, for, for, for so many years, you could take your photograph from there. And so this was about protection of the first family, but kind of unwinding the, 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 the cop scene and the, you know, the barrier scene, trying to get that to be well organized. So this is our site plan. And our proposal was to make a kind of walking promenade right there. And to try to solve all of the security in that system right there. But to keep this open and to restore, you know, a version of the Downing and Olmsted landscape or even the George Washington and Thomas Jefferson landscape that had grown and evolved there. So I'm going to click through these quickly, but this but the security issues are paramount. So here's where you kind of, you know, the dogs sniff the vehicles. If the president has lunch, you know, the, you know, they have to bring it in, right? If the president has visitors or if there's a, you know, important meeting in the war room, people all arrive here. And so every vehicle gets, you know, sniffed and searched, mirrors and so on. So how to do that? Those, you know, how many guard, guard points? How do you circulate these vehicles in and out reasonably? <coughs> How do you have increased standoff? You know, uh, I mean, I think last year, wasn't it last year, there was a, a gun fire. There was a shot fired at the White House. And then I think in the same year, there was a car kind of barreling toward the White House. Um, and sadly, uh, you know, someone was killed in that incident. So there are times when there needs to be increased standoff, they call it. And so, you know, the design had to, you know, show how that would perform. Had to be reversible, had to have, you know, ambulance uh, and fire truck access and needed bicycle access and so on. So our proposal, which is different from many of the others and quite different from the one that, that won the competition. We didn't win, by the way. Um, I like to think we came in second, and I like to think that's a good place to land. Um, was you know a, a very long promenade as I mentioned, which would look like that, and which hopefully the you know visually, spatially it would be strong and beautiful, but it would also in a sense allow the security stuff to be quieted down. It's a space that you know has evolved over time. It's just you know there's a very interesting history of the relationship to the Washington Monument and the Jefferson Memorial, as you can see. But we were suggesting that what was a street until 2001, after 9-11, that street was closed, could become a little bit like the street in front of the White House, Pennsylvania Avenue, which vehicles also cannot travel on now, except motorcades and um, permitted vehicles. And so in a sense, it was a kind of duplication of, uh, in some ways, of what Michael Van Valkenburg's um, office did seven years, eight years ago on Pennsylvania Avenue. And it was in that tradition of promenades in Paris, as you could see there, and in fact in Washington. This is a, one of the walks that Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. built along the Lincoln Reflecting Pool, you know, right, right in the neighborhood. And so that was our, our proposition was to somehow take a historical type and evolve it solve the security issues, make it spatially strong and beautiful, and then situate it in that historic landscape. And as you're now well aware, give it the life support that's needed below ground so that these trees could in fact, you know, be strong and live there for a good long time. And really think of it as having a kind of continu continuum with uh, the site's history. So, you know, that's what it looked like around the time of President Jefferson. And then that's what it looked like when Andrew Jackson Downing made a strong proposal to give it a kind of recognizable form, another historical type. And that's what it looked like after the turn of the 20th century. And so we wanted to see then also that, you know, in 2011, when we proposed this, the tree canopy was fairly depleted. But through our plan, gradually, we would see 
a, a restoration of that canopy, which is so important, as you know, I'm now hyper focused on. <coughs> so that was the site plan, and then this view, uh, you know, during the competition, um, the, these were uh, these were aired live streamed over the web presentations with the National Capital Planning Commission and then this image happened to capture people's imaginations and so it appeared in a lot of the publications. I think because it's familiar to practically anyone, right? Anyone knows that house and so it came, you know, really got around. I'm going to skip through the Duke University project um, in the interest of time. It's a complex project, a big campus project. We're doing maybe 10 projects there. And, and move to our, the final project for tonight, which is a garden. And I think this could feel familiar to some of you. Um, not be, it's not in Rhode Island, but it's on the southern coast of Connecticut. And it's in a place that's slightly rockier than here, but not, not altogether different. It's called Old Quarry. And our interest in here I think I might have just kicked that. Let's see if it just nicely comes back. Wow. Good system. Um, we were working in a quarry. And, you know, I kind of felt like a kid. Uh, it was really interesting to work in a quarry. And so, you know, the, the process of, abs of extraction of stone is interesting. And, and the remnants of the extraction are also pretty interesting. And so this was a tailings site. And there's a, a view of the, um, now something's happened because I'm seeing only a portion of the image there, but that's okay. Um, I'll keep going here. Yeah, that's better. Not, no, so I, I think my slides are now, for some reason, slightly cut off. Anyway, um, this is the condition of the site when we got there. So, you know, really rubble, right? We couldn't export any of the stone, and we didn't want to. And we had to try to find a way to make this place inhabitable. There was a house. The house is a pretty interesting house designed by a sculptor. And uh, in, in early 1950s, this is the house. It only meets the ground in a little box right there and these columns. This is the addition that was built during our project. And that's, that's kind of the overall site plan. So sorry about this uh, image being cut off. I'm not sure how to fix that, but I don't think there's time to do it. Um, so the house floats above this plane. Some of the stone is organized in field, in field stone walls. You know all of that very well. We took some of the stone from the tailings and organized paths that felt like jetties. So they didn't always connect to other paths, but visually they seemed like a familiar kind of building project along the coast, a jetty. There's a concrete slab below the house. You can see the relationship to the water. It's very close to the water. The deck, which is a portion of the house, actually has glass planks in it, and the light is really very strong. In fact, it's a lot brighter than it would be if it were a completely opaque deck. And it gives you beautiful patterns. And we also began to think this was almost like a kind of Japanese scroll painting. Coastal palette of material, lots of fern and, and blueberry plants that were really well adapted to the coast. We really had to build pockets of soil in crevices of rock here. And then we organized some of the edges of the pits and then left other stone to be. So here we were working weekly with the masons who were working every day for about a two year period to, to get a kind of balance or even a tension, I might say, between the manipulated and the leftover, the designed and the incidental. 
and in one place where we were planting trees between the wing <laughs> of the new addition and the existing house, we made what we thought of as a kind of fish scale pattern out of the stone. So all of this is stone that we found on the site. And then, you know, may, making small bridges and things with that stone also. Very crafty masons. Um, those who build landscapes in the room will get what I'm about to say, which is that um, the masons are always fastidious. They're, they're kind of the most fastidious guys on a project. And they take their time. They're really hard to schedule. Sound right, John? Um, and in a way, they overdo it. And so we, well, part of our task working with the Masons was to try to pull them back a little bit and relax their, their kind of mania about you know, making sure every edge was straight. Now, there's a lot of times when we're saying it's not straight enough. But in a case like this, you know, there was a, a kind of balance between you know, manipulated and left over. And then there's a partial view of, of the meadow, which is in fact the um, where the septic area is, with these these beautiful hawthorns, which I was opposed to. I didn't think it was the right plant for here. It's 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 a reasonably adapted plant for here, but it's showy and it's not part of what I think of as that palette. But I have come to love the 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 texture and the space that was made with these trees. I'm going to stop there by saying that um, I hope you take away a, a sense of the telescopic span of opportunity that landscape architecture gives you as a profession. And I'd, I'd be happy to take questions and to talk about that in more detail. Um, so thanks for listening for a long time. Didn't plant any questions? <laughs> well, I have Steve here. Thank you. Gary, I think you did a fabulous job of transitioning from Olmstead to, to your work telescopically. Um, question on, on your Boston Harbor project, the microforest. Was your selection of species monoculture or I, I, I'll take mm. a stab, it looked like oak in the image, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, never done this before, but I, we were working on the MIT campus and I came to realize that the microforest <coughs> above me was made of red oak and pin oak together. And we were ranging around, I mean, you know, there's about four or five species you could use there that would really tolerate those conditions. You know, it's salt spray, inundation, you know, there's just, you know, brake dust all over and, you know, a lot of constraints. So we combined pin oak and red oak. So as, as Greg knows, uh, those trees have different moisture requirements. They have different light and shade characteristics, uh, different nutrient cycling, different fall color, different retention of their leaves, characteristics, all of those turned into assets for us. And so it was really great to not plant that as a monoculture. And you know, there are two sturdy species. The pin oak is really sturdy. The red oak is more susceptible. In age, the red oak is, you know, like a champion, right? So worked out well. Good eye. Thank you. Please. So do you plan on having to remove some of the trees, or are they really going to move in kind of, you know, move with the tree as it grows and as it's under the tree? Uh, no, we, we'll remove pavers as we need to. You know, that was, that was the intention behind having them hand set and not fixed. There's no, there's no mortar on those pavers. So they're in there very tight. 
we also are able, because we inoculate these trees with compost teas every year for, you know, to accelerate nutrient exchange, we actually pick up pavers to do that. We just pick up a paver and put the probe in and then inject the compost. And so, yeah, there, there, and there was a period, by the way, when we were concerned about the stresses on the trees in their first year. And so we, we removed pavers and we inserted some steel rings so that we could have the roots, the root flares, which are, by the way, about this far below the paving, um, exposed to the air. And we could just have a little bit more, re, 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 we, that we could reduce the stress on the root zone a bit. So we had those in place, I, I don't know, for two years, I think. And then we got back to the, our original detail, which was a relief to us because we just wanted it to be like, you know, the paving goes right to the tree. So you work on, on projects. I'm, I'm interested uh, in knowing how long a project takes you to go from concept to construction. And then are you able to convince the client to keep you on call to come back and be able to adjust things in the landscape? <coughs> We certainly aim for that. The, 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 the time span of the projects varies a lot. It's never short. You know, it's, it's rarely less than a year. It's often five years. I think we had about seven years between our first engagement on the Beck House in Dallas and completion of that. But we've been back every year making adjustments. And really, that's um, it's a crucial thing though I have to say it can't always happen. It's very exotic to do that kind of work, you know, to kind of take so much of an active biology and take it away and put in a new one. You know, it's sort of a heart transplant. And so it really does take um, care and stewardship and adjustments. Really, it takes adjustments. And so we might rework some of the soil. We might introduce more organics in the soil. In the case of a meadow in um, Martha's Vineyard on the Samplain grasslands, we're, we're trying to starve the conditions. So, because because the Samplain grassland thrives in an impoverished soil, it's, that's its that's how it's adapted. And so, um, so optimally for us. We don't ever go away. The project never ends. One of your colleagues at Harvard, Ed Wilson, has written many notable books. Mm -hmm. One of them, 20 years ago, was Biophilia. In that book, he talks about the um, Savannah hypothesis, mm -hmm. the Savannah effect, and uh, the Johnson property you opened up. Yeah. The land, and uh, one thing I read about that Savannah effect is it's more pronounced in young people as we grow older. We're more environment. Hmm. I just wonder, as a practicing lifelong landscape architect, just what your thoughts are about the Savannah effect and desirability. I guess I'd have to say that I. I would generally subscribe to the theory, um, but I, I have a kind of strong point of view about um, the city, and it's interesting that you you know rem you you point out that some would say we become more maybe acclimated to urban conditions as we mature as humans. That's not surprising at all. Um, I know a lot of kids who grew up in New York City that, you know, would, would love to say the opposite is also true, and they, you know, they want to be out in the country and, uh, you know, later in life. That's not the opposite of what you said. Um, one thing I love about my field is that um, it is about change, and urbanization is a change process. And I think we don't consider enough 
say, you know, in our studies and our even in our work. It's increasingly more important in our scholarship um, that landscape architecture can, is about keeping things, but it's also about changing things. And more often than not, it's about changing things. And I would even say that in preservation and in conservation, not at the scale of um, you know, the Mariposa Grove or you know, the Yosemite Park or the national parks or the state parks, but at the scale of people's properties and institutional places, it's more about change than it is about keeping. Because we're all the time managing inputs to natural systems. Don't seem very natural at all, except if you think about them on a molecular or a biological level. Um, maybe my point is that I think landscape architecture has to engage the city more. And um, you know, I'm happy that our work has given us the opportunity to do that. And I, I, want, I want the students to think hard about that. It's great living in the country, but the country wouldn't be the country without the city. Well, if you don't have any other, oh, you have one. Gary, you know, the Lee's Boardwalk, yeah. it's a project on a grand scale, given limitation. I'm curious, the design of your helical pile, is that based on soil pouring data or, or good working relationship with the install, installation contract or with, with the handheld machine? Well, both. We had a soils. We have a structural design consultant and a soil consultant. We don't go anywhere without a soils guy. I mean, that's really the that's reality, right? And it's come late in our field in a sense, but you know, we all are now recognizing that it's folly to do anything if you don't consider the structural, chemical, and biological properties of the soil you're working on. And so that we spend a whole lot of time on that. And so uh, you know, the amount of resistance in the mud was something that had to be tested. We did borings. And so, you know, in the same way that we were counting reptiles, we were also understanding the um, structural characteristics of the soil, or let's say the resist characteristics in the soil. And the helical pile turned out to be a really simple answer, really good. Because I think we learned that you, 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 would, you would find resistance way deeper in a, you know, in a, in a mini pile or a, you know, a straight pile. And so the helical pile, they found enough resistance. By the way, there has been a little bit of movement, which I have come to like. The owner's a little freaked out by it. Um, but it does occasionally move like this. And, and um, I don't know, that seems to me to you know, kind of be a nice element of it. So there has been a little bit of subsidence, um, maybe more, a little more than we predicted. Well, what I, I want to thank Gary uh, for this evening's talk, which is great. I'd also welcome any of the students or any of you who are here to ask Gary any other questions. He'll be here for 19 more hours. And um, thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good. Good. Me too.